Good morning. I'm Eric Loudermilk, and I serve as the interim pastor here at Oasis at Conway Gardens. And we're glad to have everybody here, including a few yeah. new people behind me. This is, uh, these are friends, uh, fellow musicians of our worship pastor, Jeremy Murata. And Henry's going to lead them today. Jeremy is, uh, Pastor Jeremy is managing a lot of things right now. There's so much that goes on when this happens. And that's a little bit why we're a little bit behind in starting. A couple announcements. Uh, our back-to-school blast yesterday was the back-to-school downpour. Uh, but we still service some families. We do have, uh, if any of you know uh, teachers in your neighborhood, we still have three packets of school supplies for teachers. So first come, first serve, just see Stephanie uh, after service, and we'll get those to you. Um, I think that's it. So let's open in a word of prayer, and we're going to have a little moment of silence so we can sort of gather our nerves, and they're gonna, we're going to worship God today. Thank you, Lord, for the good news, the strange good news, the profound contradiction that the creator of the entire universe would choose to save us by dying. Help us to celebrate your love and your, your goodness today. In Jesus' name, amen. Henry? Good morning, church. Oh, all right. Good morning. You know, good, right? uh, amen. You guys don't know us and we don't know you, but you know what? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? And we're all here for one purpose and one purpose only, and it's to glorify the name of the Lord. Amen. And our first song, it calls you to do just that. Come, let us worship our King because he has done great things. And I know that if I ask you guys in individual ways, how he has been great to you I will hear so many different stories and I think our job is to remember those great things that he has done for us and I want you to listen to the words but try, try to sing along with us as well because we don't want to just sing by ourselves we want you guys to worship God in music and in song so please join us as we sing great things amen Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah. 
unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. O oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. O oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, you have done great things, oh God, you do great things. Praise the Lord, right? And like we said at the beginning, God is good. Amen? Yeah. Everybody say that again. God is good? Amen. And all the time. Let's try it one more time. God is good? God is good. And all the time, God is good. Praise his name this morning. Again, we are so grateful to be here and worship the Lord together with you guys today. I, I got confused, but you know what? We are so grateful we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Yeah, we do things a little different. We, uh, and this is Jeremy, Pastor Jeremy's idea to make the worship as a response to a sermon. Uh, you guys may be seated. You know and what? I was doing so good there. Just, I'm sorry, Pastor. Sorry. All right, just call me Eric. Um, I would have been fine to let y'all keep going, and I just not speak at all. Let's give them a hand. You guys enjoy that? So, lead guitar. What's your name again? James. James. I think it's The Edge. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So, one of my favorite bands is U2, and that guy is The Edge. Can you play Bullet the Blue Sky? Can you run El Salvador through, a, through an amp? Yeah, it's a great song. Wow. Uh, what a great day to be in God's house. Thank you, Jeremy and friends, for uh, leading us in worship. And you guys are coming back in a month, right? End of the month, and next week, and the week after. Our text today is going to be in two places, again, both in the New Testament. Uh, I'll tell you what they are, and we'll chat in a minute while you're turning. Colossians 3.21 and Titus 2.3. Colossians 3.21 and Titus 2.3. We're going to be talking about parenting uh, all this month, and our series is called dysfunctional parenting, moving from dysfunctional to functional parenting. <clears throat> parenting is the greatest thing you'll ever do and the hardest thing you'll ever do. And so we need to chat about it. Let's uh, stand for the reading of God's Word. I'll read the Colossians passage first, if you get your fingers there. And then we'll flip over to, Col to Titus 2.3. Ready? Colossians 3.21, the Apostle Paul writes, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. I think I added anger there from the Ephesians passage. I looked up. Let me read it again. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. And then in Titus 2.3, Paul is writing a letter to the young pastor Titus, and he's instructing older women that we're going to hear his idea for young women and what they're to be taught. So I'm going to read two, three, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Remember that, honey, not much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Let's pray. Father, today, as we tackle one of the toughest things we do in families, that is raising our children, we invite your presence in here. Indeed, your presence is already here, ushered in by worship. And of course, you say you're always with us where we gather to worship you. But today, Lord, we ask that you would help us with this difficult topic. I pray, Lord, once again that I can hide behind the cross. I do not deserve to be here, especially as a parent with the mistakes I've made. 
But it's your blood and your cross that covers us. So may your word today shine and I recede into the shadows. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Years ago, one of my good friends, Adam Lynch, had his first child, and we were on the same work team at Palm Beach Atlantic University back when I was in West Palm. And he had his leave, and he came back, and we were having staff meeting that morning. And we said, well, you've had your first child. It's been two or three weeks now, or whatever the leave was he had. We said, what do you think? I'll never forget it. He sighed and looked down. He said, you know, a lot of people told us what it would be like. Some said it'll be this way, and some said it'll be that way. But after this short time of being a dad, I've determined one thing. Parenting is the hardest thing you'll ever do and the most amazing thing you'll ever do. And we've learned that in our home. Before I was at Palm Beach Atlantic University, I was at Evangel University, and I was a resident director of a men's hall of about 180 guys. And we had the lobby, and then our apartment but was behind the lobby, and what connected the two was my office. And so I could be in the office meeting and talking, and uh, I could get a knock on the door or Patty could stick her head in and uh, tell me something or someone from the lobby could stick their head in. And uh, at this particular time, my wife was working. I think she was working in the snack bar they called the Joust. And so uh, I think this day, I didn't have a sitter, but my now oldest son was old enough to watch TV and I could crack the door, you know. So I'm having a very serious discipline meeting with a student, very serious. And the door creaks open, and in walks my oldest son with his diaper full of solid waste. I said to the student who was scared to death of the discipline meeting, I said, meeting dismissed, we'll pick it up later, and he was greatly relieved. Parenting is the greatest thing you ever do, and it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Probably the hardest story, and for years I couldn't tell this story. It's just too difficult. Uh, Rachel is our oldest, and we were young parents, and we were learning the ropes. And uh, she didn't want to go to sleep at night. She gets it honest. It comes from my dad's side of the family, and I have a lot of trouble sleeping or going to sleep. Once I'm there, we have no problem at all, do we, honey? I sleep like a rock. But we were learning the practice of going and console tell the child to go to sleep and then come back and give them 30 seconds and then go in and console, tell them to go to sleep, love on them and give them double the time to a minute. And this was the teaching at the time. I don't know if it's changed, but this particular night was really rough and we'd gotten to up to 20 minutes and I don't know if 20 minutes, 60 minutes and eventually she went to sleep. We thought, ah, we're learning as parents. But you have to realize When the times had gotten longer, she's crying, Daddy, Daddy, and you know. But we had heard that a lot, you know. And she's in her crib. She's old enough to stand up in the crib. So after a lot of this daddy and crying and us consoling and hugging and doubling the time, somewhere around 20 minutes she went to sleep. Two or three hours later in the night, I had to get up and go to the restroom, so I went to check on her. She had cried herself sick. And had thrown up in her crib. And when daddy didn't come for her, she wiped out a place of the vomit and laid down and went to sleep. I couldn't tell that story for a few years because it was one of my epic failures. Parenting is the greatest thing you'll ever do and the hardest thing you'll ever do. Probably the hardest thing for us was the singing of the hymn, He Cometh for His Jewels. Because we sang that while lowering our unborn child, Leah Victoria, into the ground in Springfield, Missouri, off Farm Road 165. Days before that, I remember crying on the phone to my father. I'm an adult man, father of two children, and just screaming on the phone, I don't want to bury my child in Missouri because I'm from North Carolina. You see, Leah was the third unborn child we lost. Sierra was before her, and the first one we, we didn't get to name. Parenting is the most amazing thing you'll ever do, and it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. What does Scripture say? Well, the most frequented passage on parenting is Proverbs twenty-two, sixteen: Train up a child in the way 
he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart of it. But many people struggle with this text, and I think rightly so, and that's because we have wrongly interpreted it. You see, Proverbs are not laws, and we teach this in seminary. I've taught it a million times. A proverb is a concise statement that expresses a commonplace truth or useful thought. And what we do is we go to Scripture and think every text of Scripture is a prescriptive law. Love your neighbor as yourself, you know, and, and that we have to always do that. And whatever promise is always too. But we read Scripture in a post-scientific age. And we read Scripture from a culture in America where we're not trained in literature. And this is a specific genre. And it's not meant to be a guarantee. We do this in our culture, but we forget it. We have proverbs in our culture. One of them is, a healthy, balanced diet maintained regularly over the course of a human life will most likely lead to longevity, decreased health issues, and reduced expenditures on health care. We all agree with that. But we turn it into a proverb by saying, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. But yet we don't rage our fists at God if we eat an apple a day and we end up in the doctor's office. Plus, I don't know anyone who eats an apple every day. Which leads me to the point, how dare we ever claim that we are so perfect that we perfectly train up a child on the way he should go. I know I haven't. But the axiom certainly is true, and right parenting matters. So today we're going to talk about loving our children. Loving our children in our four-part series. First, we're going to talk about loving children in three ways. Touch, time, and word. And first, we're going to talk about touch. When Rachel was born, I did get one thing right, Um, our uh, pediatrician was really on the same page with us at that time. Is that the right word, pediatrician? The doctor who handles with babies? She's my preaching coach. Uh, We were of the teaching that touching and holding the first three hours or so after birth is the right thing to do rather than putting the child on a cold steel table and weighing them and giving them their vitamin K shot and so forth. So uh, I, I, I actually, the, the pediatrician, when she delivered Rachel, I actually took my shirt off. Well, I actually took her in my arms and we went to the room and then I took my shirt off and held Rachel to my chest and sang to her for three hours. Now, some of you are just sick now because you're thinking of me without a shirt on, but let's move on from that. Touch matters. Science tells us that touch matters. Now, what if I'm, a lot of what I'm telling you is coming from an article by Pamela Owen and Jonathan Gillentine. Please touch the children. Appropriate touch in the classroom. You see, because of the problem of abuse in our culture, teachers are now afraid to touch our children. And so there's a, this article that is written about appropriate touch with children. And the beginning of her article deals with a lot of parental touch. And, of course, today we're talking about appropriate touch. Child abuse by inappropriate touch is horribly wrong and an entirely another subject that we'll address at a later time. Appropriate touch, however, is considerably being increasingly considered by scientists as crucial for human development. Benefits have been documented in the areas of physical, emotional, social, and cognitive development. Physical development. It's believed now that physical touch is necessary for human development. Researchers, it's become so common, they don't even need to document it, that in multiple orphanages, there are stories of children dying from the lack of touch. Touch can relieve physical pain, ease physical uh, reactions of asthma, boost the immune system, and actually promote growth. Many theorists contend that physical touch is uh, necessary for growth, physical growth, but emotional too. Children benefit from touch emotionally. It can lessen depression, soothe emotions, and affirm individuality. Children, however, are often, and I've been guilty of this, of being unsupported emotionally with touch when they watch TV, play video games, or use the computer. It's become the babysitter. And a casual observer will sometimes see someone, a parent, telling a child, it'll be okay, get over it. Or stop crying. Or go to your room, when what we really need is touch. 
Touch also benefits social development. A nurturing touch promotes positive social interactions. It's been linked to building positive relationships between adults and children. And conversely, it lowers aggression. So even though while we're talking the context of parenting in this article, this researcher is telling teachers appropriate touch will build the relationship with your children and reduce aggression in the classroom. Wow, how much more at home. Cognitive development. One study showed that an intelligence test, uh, the scores rose in children following a 15-minute massage. Later studies provide evidence of increased alertness following massage. Touch stimulates the central nervous system and ameliorates the problems of ADHD and autism. Children can learn more effectively when their basic needs are met, including touch. So if you want your children to do well in school or your future children or your grandchildren, hold them, hug them, stroke their, their hair, hold them in your arms. Psalm 103 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Now what's interesting about this verse is the psalmist is saying that the Lord is compassionate. But the assumed presupposition is that a father shows compassion. Now as a confession, and and part of my attempt at pastoring is to be real with you. And when my older two were in middle school, I got a little weirded out by touch. Probably I wasn't touched enough as a child. I don't know. My parents were amazing. Hi, Mom. Dad, you're great. But I just prayed through it and and did the best I could. And I continued to pray. And then when our third one came along, I didn't even think about it. And years later now, I'm like, somehow I got through that. You see, love is a choice. And sometimes we do things that we don't feel like doing. Maybe when you're angry with a child, you don't want to touch them. Maybe when you come home first from work, you don't want to hug and touch. But it's what we choose to do. In fact, the effects of touch early can lead to greater touch going on. Now, if you're here today or listening online or watching the recording on YouTube and you say, man, I probably haven't touched my children enough, I wouldn't advise going into your 15-year-old's room and saying, son, and just wrapping your arms around him. They're humans just like you, and it takes some time. And I started a little better with our youngest. And on a recent drive to South Carolina, we had to drive all night long. And because of the next day's schedule, we had planned ahead. I slept in the day before so that he could sleep in the truck. He needed to be freshest for the next day. And I'm very thankful that at age 20, he could lay down his head on my leg and I could put my arm on his shoulder as he slept. I wasn't that accustomed to touch at that age, but I'm thankful that starting early and working at it, you can build up an acceptance of touch, appropriate touch. And if you're starting late, work into it, pray over it, and so forth. Secondly, love your children with your time. Love your children with your time. Jacob, obviously and unfortunately, loved Joseph and Benjamin more than the other ten sons. Now, there were other problems in the family But I think scripture is pretty clear if we read it closely that there was a time gap with the other ten sons. How do we know that? Because he kept keeping Joseph and Benjamin back from leaving home. This resulted in rebellion by the other ten. In Genesis 37, we hear that Joseph, when he was 17 years old, his father made a multicolored coat for him because he's the favorite. We know that. And scripture tells us that Jacob loved Joseph more than the others. But if you notice in verse 12 of chapter 37 that his brothers were out in the fields of Shechem watching the sheep. And he then tells his son, go check on your brothers. Well, what does that mean? That means Joseph has more father time than the other ten. And it doesn't pay off. And you say, well, that's not enough, Pastor. Well, this shows up later. If you fast forward the story of Joseph... When they think he's dead, he's been in Egypt 20 years and he's second in command and the brothers come down for food and he keeps Simeon because they claim they have another brother 
And he sends them back with grain and says, you'll never see my face unless you bring this supposed other brother with you. Jacob won't do it. You see, they had gone to Egypt without Benjamin, and 20 years have transpired. And so Benjamin's a grown man now, but Dad kept him back with him and still won't let him go now. Dad is still spending more time with one and not enough time with the other ten. We need to spend time with our children and love them with our time. A pastor in Missouri at a church where we were at, I've never forgotten the the message, he said, when you come home, and especially fathers, the first thing you should do is put down your work things and go to your children. Now, priority-wise, I would say go to your wife first. But assuming you have a mature enough marriage and she knows that those children are learning and that you can have time together later, you need to go to the children first because they are developing. They're only thinking with their feelings at this point and you need to benefit their feelings by showing them love. Research shows a link with time and development as well. Certain activities such as reading, playing, eating dinner together, that kind of time furthers a child's development. Parental time inputs are thought to be an important determinant in a child's educational outcomes and presumably other outcomes as well. One study in 2001 found that children whose parents read or play with them more often have fewer behavioral problems and better grades. How many people who've been a parent of a teenager would like to have fewer behavioral problems? I'm sure Jacob would have liked to have had fewer behavioral problems and perhaps had he spent more time and perhaps if I had spent more time things would have gone better. Many studies demonstrate a connection between eating dinner as a family and a wide range of outcomes. One 1988 study found that children whose mothers spend more time at home complete more years of schooling. A 1999 study found that children with more involved fathers uh, are unlikely to have behavioral problems. Okay, so scripture and research, maybe you've convinced me, Pastor. What kind of time? Almost any kind of time that's neutral or positive. And this was a slow lesson I had to learn. When my youngest turned uh, mid-teen and I started seeing the end where he would move out, I made a list on my iPhone of all the stuff I had to tell him. And I said, we're going to start going to Denny's and I'm going to give you some insight. How well do you think that went with a teenager? (laughs) Well, you got it, but I didn't. And I'm sitting there at Denny's with my phone out. He's going, Dad, what are you doing? (laughs) The best time we've had is when we bought his first car. A professor uh, gifted but sold us his, I think it was an 88 Bronco for $50. And in the beginning, it was awkward because he didn't want to work on cars. And I remember the first oil change. We have pictures of that on Facebook. I rented a carpet cleaner to clean the inside of my car. And I said, go do yours. And he did like the front seats and let it go. He didn't want to work. But things went on. And then he uh, wanted to buy a car to rebuild to make like a hot little hot rod. And I just resisted it, resisted it, resisted it. And he found a 1989 no, no, 1993 Miata up in Gainesville for sale for 500 bucks that had been wrecked. And I said, no, I, we can't rebuild a car. And then it hit me. Wait a minute. If we can't rebuild a car, then you're not driving. Absolutely, you can buy that car. And we threw wrenches. We yelled at each other. We, we walked out of the garage, storm and mad. But over the years, that has become our bonding point. And the congregation knows that's my car now. Um, we've spent probably four grand on it, less than I would spend if I went out and bought me a new car. And it means so much to us. And we have hugged a lot of times when we finished a big project. Any kind of time, neutral or positive, is good. When I was growing up, for me, it was fishing and hunting with my dad. We did a lot of bike riding. Just time. And as you listen to their stories they will then indicate to you when they need your input. When they're four or five, you can say, now we don't do this, do we? But you can't say that when they're 15 or 16. 
if you don't keep in their face, they're going to come to you when they sense that you're giving up your time to be with them because you care for them. And then they are going to go, Dad, what do you think about this? Time with our children. Thirdly, words. We need to love our children with our words. We need to love our children through our words. Now, we've all heard stories or heard our parents talk about their parents' generation in which parents loved their children, but it wasn't a culture in which it was normative to say, I love you. Thankfully, we are seeing research now that tells us that's not right. We are experiencing it, and they did their best, and they did well. But well-established psychologist and director of counseling at Bryan College and mother of two, Professor Packery says, Enough of go to your room. Affirm the emotions. Let them know that emotions are normal. The Apostle Paul seems to agree. So Paul tells us in both Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3.21, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, lest they become discouraged. Professor Packery will often say to her four-year-old, You're feeling bad because you can't go to the Lego store today? It rained us out. Yeah, child just screaming and crying. Yeah, that's sad. I know too. You see, she's teaching them to self-regulate by first identifying with that valid emotion, but don't expect a four-year-old to know how to regulate that emotion. And then she'll say, what if we went on another day when it's not raining? I'm sad too. That's better than go to your room or get over it. University of Rochester health researchers tell us that to remind your teens that they're resilient and competent because they're so focused in the moment, teens have trouble seeing that they can play a part in changing bad situations. It can help to remind them of times in the past where they overcame those situations. See, researchers tell us that children up until... Early adulthood are thinking with the amygdala. And I'm sure Professor Packery will co correct me later if I get this wrong. That's the feeling center of the brain. The thinking center is the prefrontal cortex where logic and thinking happen. And that does not mature until ages 25 to 30. And sorry, guys, later for us. Some of you wives are still hoping it'll mature. Up until age 25 to 30, a child, a, a child of an adult, not that they're little children, doesn't have the physical ability to process problems like some of us older folks do. And it's the job of parents to teach and model and help them process that. In teens' brains, the connections between the emotional part of the brain and the decision part of the brain are still developing. And not always at the same rate. You may have one child who can process emotions much quicker than another child. Don't berate that other child. Work with them. Touch them. Spend time with them. And in your words, acknowledge these emotions and help them. You see, when a child is experiencing a tough emotion, such as anger or sadness, they can't think logically they are only feeling and they're not thinking now our daughter Rachel I, I, I asked my children <laughs> I sent a text yesterday and I said hey I'm preaching on parenting for the next four weeks you guys have some stories you think would be uh, good to illustrate these five principles and I should have got Jeremy to play crickets right now <laughs> no text back in fact our youngest said sea world laugh out loud and and one of the times I was trying to spend time with our children at SeaWorld, uh, there was one of these netting things, these tall plate houses, but there's like a fisherman's net and you run across it slowly and then you crawl through a hole in a gate and we're like three stories up. And I don't know, I just got this burst of energy, I'm going to be a real dad. And so I ran across the net really fast, which you'd think I'd have had the accident there, but no. Instead of going through the railing, I leaped over the railing, and when I planted my right leg, the knee buckled and snap. I heard it snap. My ACL went. That's the story my son said. Yeah, Dad, tell that about parenting. 
But I did text our daughter today. So I'm going to tell the late night tired thing. She goes, okay. So uh, many, many times, she was the, she's the firstborn and always wants to get her homework done and all that. And so she had very, very high standards for herself. Now at the time, I didn't know her prefrontal cortex wasn't developing. I didn't know what her prefrontal cortex was. But uh, she would just get overwhelmed with homework, and I would say, baby, it's okay. You're just tired. <laughs> and she would say, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. And then after years of it, it got to be, don't tell me I'm tired. I told her she better watch this message today. They, uh, they don't have that thinking ability to stop and say, I'm tired. I, I will feel different tomorrow. That comes with age. And so our job with our words is to acknowledge that pain. Homework is important to you. I'm so proud of you that homework matters. Why don't we try to get a little rest? I'm not tired! Sometimes it still doesn't work. A parent has the ability in their words to redirect, to affirm emotion, and to strengthen the child. Let me close with this story. Parenting is the greatest thing you'll ever do. And of course, as I said earlier, it is the hardest thing you'll ever do. But if you move it from dysfunctional to functional by loving your children through touch, time, and words, it changes. At baseball games, when we lived in West Palm Beach, my two youngest sons played baseball. And if um, my youngest son sees this, I'm just going to acknowledge that when he was a little boy, the coaches called him the vacuum. <laughs> He'd just pick up those balls. But baseball wasn't his thing. But at a little boy, they called him the vacuum because he could catch. But I would see very, very competitive parents yelling at their children, screaming at them, mad when they didn't win. And I have one memory in particular that I don't know if it's from the field or if I saw in a movie of one father popping his son's head on the back of the head for not making a play or winning the game. Joseph Newgarden is an American race car driver that competes in the IndyCar series full-time for Penske. He's the 2017 and 2019 IndyCar series champion. Recently, he said of his father that unlike some parents in sports who would get mad at their children when they didn't make the play, Newgarden's father was different. His dad would not get mad. Instead, his dad would encourage him that you'll get it next time. And then he'd say, let's figure out how they beat you in the go-kart track. Let's figure that out and let's get them next time. In fact, when asked, why are you able to win so many races so early on, Newgarten said, my secret weapon was my father. Through the tools of time, touch, and positive words, let's become the secret weapon for our children and move from dysfunctional to functional parenting. Praise God for our Jesus, amen? He's the only one that gives us strength, Pastor, to be good parents. This next song speaks about building our life upon Jesus and the love that he shows us every day. And it's my prayer this morning that as we sing this song, that we can express that love that Jesus shares through us with our kids every day the rest of our lives. Jesus, 
Jesus, the only one you could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe the band continues to play and we go to a time of prayer and confession I want to mention that we lost Diane Rectine this week Dr. Diane Rectine her and her sister Sandy Bowling would sit back here in front of Kathy I had a very beautiful visit with Diane this week and she was ready she was ready to meet her Savior and ready in peace pray for Sandy and their their daughters Wayne and Georgia and Roberta and the rest of the family. Faye Henderson is in uh, physical therapy home recovering from hip surgery. We pray you continue to bless her, that the Lord would bless her. And Lucy, if I get this incorrect, please clarify for me. But Lucy's granddaughter in the law, having been previously vaccinated, has COVID and a, a pretty significant case of it. So we need to pray for her. Are there other prayer requests in the congregation that you'd like to mention? 
I know that Kathy... Debbie or Chris? Chris. Okay, and remind me, Chris is your sister? Sister. So we should pray for Debbie as well, who has cancer, and Chris, who has diabetes. Okay, and someone over here. Who was it over here? I know we should keep praying for Bud and Jackie. Uh, Self, uh, Jackie is asking for prayer that her oxygen... Levels could be reduced rather than increasing. That's a concerning sign, and I know Floyd is still continuing to recover, and Anne has been sick. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll roll right into a time of confession. Father, we thank you again and again and again and again for this crazy story that you loved us so much that you'd rather die than hold us accountable for our sins. Who does that, God? Much less the creator of the entire universe. I think of astronauts who look back on the earth and feel how small we are. And then we think about you, how great you are, that you created the entire universe. And yet you chose to die rather than to hold us accountable for our mess. What a great God you are. And we thank you for the chance to worship you again today. Lord, we lift up the Rectine family, Sandy Bowling and... Diane's uh, children, Wayne, Georgia, and Roberta, and their spouses and children, we pray you'd comfort them in this time of loss and yet rejoicing that Diane is now with her Savior. We pray for Faye that you would continue to heal and strengthen her body and encourage her because she's in a facility where she can't have visitors. We pray that you would bless her, Lord. For Chris and Debbie, Kathy's sisters, who are both struggling physically, and an ongoing battle in that family. I pray that you would bless these ladies and the other members of her family who are sick. I think of the boys and their developmental issues. I pray you would bless and heal that family, Lord. For Jackie and Bud Self, we pray that you would bless and heal them. And for Ann and Floyd West, we pray for them. And now, Father, we're going to come to you to confess what's going on this week. I'm going to ask Scott and the band to just play light in the background. And I want you to just take a few moments to think over this week as we do every week. Where have you deserved God's grace this week? I don't mean deserved it because you were good, but deserved it because you've reminded the Father that he, you need his salvation again. Was it a word that you spoke out of turn? Or thoughts? Many thoughts if you're like me that did not honor God this week. The beauty of the Christian faith is we get to lay those at the feet of Jesus every hour, every moment, every week with the assurance that He died for that. This is the joy in the Christian walk. That even though we try to live for Christ out of thankfulness, when we fail as we do every day, He is there to give us that grace. So let's just take a moment and pause and think over this week. If you're young, you may feel that you fail Him more than others and you don't live like the older folks. Well, that will come with time. Bring those things to Him. If you're an older saint, and you're seeing sins in your life that you didn't see when you are young. And you're sad because you continue to commit those sins. Bring those to Jesus today. And let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, your kingdom come in my life. Your will be done in my life on earth as it is in heaven. Give my family today our daily bread. Give my neighbors our daily bread. And Lord, forgive me my sins as I'm going to choose to forgive those who sin against me. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from it. Deliver us from the evil one. And what's great, God, is that to you be all the glory and power kingdom the power and the glory amen 
And Father, we conclude this time by lifting up our world and our nation. So broken. So broken. We live in a world that is cursed because of sin. And we pray that you would turn the hearts of our leaders to you. That you would give them wisdom even when they don't know it, Father. And that you would heal our land, heal us of this disease. And help us to love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I love worship. I love worshiping our God. Wow. It's all you, Henry. I'm, just, I'm getting so excited. Take it away, man. It's all you, Jeremy. <laughs> it's really good to, to play and sing with these guys. I hope you guys are enjoying kind of having a little different mix today. I'm excited because it's my son's birthday today. Yeah. He turns two. Woo. And so talking about parenting, all these things hit home for me, Eric. I'm just letting you know. I'm, I'm back here, by the way. You can't see me, but uh, this is what we had to, to do to kind of get set up this morning. I just praise the Lord that we can be sons and daughters of God. Amen. And we just ask it. And it's, praise the Lord that, that I'm a child of God. And we're all children of God. Here we go. Who am I that the highest king would wear? I was lost, but he brought me and oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun says free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. has ransomed me his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun says free oh is free indeed I'm a child out the kinks today but isn't this great <laughs> it's really good to have these guys we're getting ready for the offering so if our ushers would come forward I'll say our prayer over the offering and then we'll turn it over to Jeremy if you're visiting with us please don't feel obligated to give the band you need to all give please <laughs> um, every... <laughs> I've got a mic here for you <laughs> No, everyone's welcome to give, but the responsibility of giving is regular attenders and members. Let's pray. Father, we, as we give back to you in gratitude for everything you've done, remind us that we're richer than three quarters of the world. Help us to give generously. But then, Father, I pray you'd multiply these gifts, Lord, as you have done 
How many churches can come through COVID and still be in the black? It's such a small church, and yet, God, you were so faithful through this time. You've been blessing us, and we've seen people come to know you. We pray that you take these funds and multiply them as you multiplied the fish and the loaves so that we can reach this community with this crazy good story. I pray as I like to pray every week, God, that you bless these homes. It's difficult to make a living, especially in these post-COVID conditions. I pray you'd bless these givers, bless their homes, bless their jobs, and fill their homes with bounty. We thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this song here is kind of personal for me. Um, it's kind of my life experience, if you would. Um, I think most of us, at some point in our Christian walk, has found ourselves in a very dark place. And we have no option but to reach out to heaven and just have God just kind of embrace us and give us new life. And he becomes our living hope. And to me... This song just says it all. And I live and breathe that living hope. And I want you guys to not just watch us here playing and sing, but just sing along with us because this is probably your own experience as well. Living hope.
to breathe out on the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me the morning that sealed the Over 20 years ago, one night, when we were living in that male residence hall, I let something get stuck in my head that was more important than it was, and we had an argument. It was a fight. I don't remember what it was about, but it literally went on until 2 a.m. in the morning. And I finally realized that I was being an idiot. I'm not talking about last night, I'm talking about 23 years ago. I've never forgotten ending that night weeping and saying, all I care is that my children turn out right. All I care is that our children turn out right. I don't care if I end up in ministry. I just want my children to turn out right. You fast forward 20 years later, I'm working on my dissertation, scheduling time with my children. I'd read to my, I'd work till 8.30, come home, read to my youngest. I'd schedule lunches with my middle schooler at the time and I take Patty on dates we mapped it all out to put family first and the first weekend after my doctorate was passed I made this long honey to do list and I thought I was going to fix the world in one weekend and Saturday I was just going at it going at it all been out of shape trying to be a super father and one of my older children finally had enough and yelled you just can't come back into our life this way and then it dawned on me that despite all my attempts to put time, touch, and words first, I had failed. Now that child is serving Jesus better than I can. You're going to fail. Sometimes parenting feels dysfunctional. But let me tell you, you're going to have to be more countercultural than you realize, more intentional than you realize, because that's my experience. You'll get penalized at work for putting your children first but you will never regret it. You will never regret loving your children. Have a great week. Love you guys.
what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. stuck around long enough for the end of this video, I just want to thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. If I could, I just want to take one more second of your time today to ask you and encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts are under the name Oasis at Conway Gardens. And if I could, I want to encourage you to like videos, comment on them, and even share them to your own social media accounts. Now this is not a way for the church to become more popular and we don't make any money off of likes, comments, or shares. This is just a way for us in a digital age to be able to share the gospel. We want to get the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for us out to a broken and hurting world and this is one of the best ways that we can do that. So if you could take just a second to go follow our social media accounts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and maybe the next time you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, comment on it, or share it to your social media accounts if you feel compelled to do so. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.